You're listening to a gag on this podcast. <laughs> This is the gag on this podcast episode. Ep- the fuck episode description. We'll have the show and guest social media. Subscribe to our YouTube page. Hear the episode two days before it is released. Like and follow us on social media. Do all that fun stuff. Gag on this podcast dot com is our website. I am Big Nick. I am joined by nationally traveling comedian, the Italian stallion that is Danny D. We got co-host of the Stand Up Dads podcast and my Portuguese lover, Rob. Hello. All right, let's see if I can get through that. We have host of the Iambic Poetry podcast, DJ for Comedy on the Rocks, and Sacramento Poet Laureate, Sharon. Hey, what's going on? Who's in a car annoyingly. (laughs) 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 Fuck. But that doesn't matter. We are here. I passed the cannon line. <laughs> we are here because we are joined. We got a pretty big grab for this episode. We got the hilarious Gianmarco Soresi. Hello. Can I please tell you how narcissistic I am? When you said nationally touring comedian, Italian stallion, I thought, okay, I guess that was my intro. And then when I heard it, I was like, I'm like, yeah, I suck. I just the worst. I saw it in your eyes. I saw it in your eyes. Like, oh, is he talking about me? And I'm like, yeah, that's right. Oh my god, it was. I was embarrassed for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, you're, you're. I saw a clip. You're Italian and Jewish, correct? Yeah, I'm much more Jewish. Like, my name is Gianmarco Sorese. Oh, uh, my dad's like. My dad told me I was super Italian. Then as I got older and older, I would ask him questions and like uh, great grandma, something Italian maybe. And it's, uh, I lived a lie. Oh, <laughs> damn it. Yeah. Family trees can be rough. <laughs> your name is like so fucking Italian. You, you, they, you have no roots. Like then the, your, your dad can't answer any questions about your fucking... I, what I literally did, I, I, went, to, I went to Europe, uh, like backpacking, like after college. And my dad said we had family in Sicily. And I, like, I was headed to Sicily and I was like, hey, can you ring up the family you're always talking about? And he was like, he was like, yeah, I'll see what I can do. And then the day I was like, dad, I'm leaving. Can we contact the family, the Sorezi yeah, no family? family? And he was like, uh, they're, they're, they're not real, son. It's a lie. I was like, I'm going oh, to Italy to see them. <laughs> I'll get you in contact with my family. They'll treat Thank you like you. family. No problem. It. Yeah, Danny, is this like, is this like going home for you? Got another uh, it's, like, it's like my cousin, yeah. I was like looking at him like, oh, my long lost cousin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. one thing I, I have to say, we've interviewed a bunch of comedians and you are by far the first to ever do a comedy show on the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, wait, now, have you guys been doing outdoor shows? Has that been like a yes. thing? Yes. That has. Okay, so this, this, was, this felt like, I mean, New York, when it hit, it was like March 15th, everything, everything shut down. And it was like three months, at least here, before the talks of outdoor shows even began. So this was like a rare, on a truck bed, no one knew what was going to be like. Uh, And also, like, it just happened to be like the day after the video of George Floyd came out. So it was like, it was not not a great time. (laughs) It was not a great time to be like, comedy too. And it was on a truck bed. It ended up being like a two hour show. I I don't think I was even booked on it, but I showed up because I was like, you know, maybe they'll, they'll throw me on. And I decided to go later. I was thinking I was a little nervous. Some comedian was like, dude, it's going to feel like you went backwards two years. And I was like, nah, not me. When I get on that truck bed, ugh, it's going to flow back. And I get up there and I'm like shaking again. <laughs> I have to pee. I do one joke that I've been doing well on Zoom. It bombs. It gets like a, it's, it's like a groaner. It's like a dad joke. 
I got to warn people up before I do it. But I opened with it. It bombed. Then the police came, shut the whole thing down. <laughs> and I like, I walked back home with my comedian friend and I was like, I didn't bomb that bad, did I? It was one of those. And he was like, well, you only did one joke. And I, I was like, but it wasn't that bad, right? It was, it was devastating. I felt like a moron. <laughs> it was the worst. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. For sure. How do you feel about Zoom shows? Because we've talked to a couple of comedians and it's, it's hit or miss with like some people really love it and then some people absolutely hate it. I know Danny likes it a ton, right, Danny? I like it for the networking purposes uh, and just to work shit out that I don't have to leave my house, but I don't like it for doing like comedy shows, but I, I do like it for networking. Yeah. It's definitely cool where it's like, yeah, and I got a show in LA tonight and New York and Georgia. Like it's cool in that sense. But I think it's just really, it's, I, I've written a lot more um, one linery type stuff. And I think it's just because the measurement of zoom laughter that's just like what ends up working better where i can go like set up really clear punchline wait okay that works and so it's frustrating there's just like certain kinds of bits or like stories that feel just hard to like assess how it's landing over zoom so i, I i'm doing it but i had i did an hour just an hour zoom before this and it's daunting. There's just a feeling of like, I'm going to have to generate so much energy to not just, just die 20 <laughs> minutes in. So, you know, I'm making money off them. I'm doing holiday parties coming up, family reunions. I did a bachelorette show. So uh, I can't add some way to make money right now. I am with it. I'm a hustler. I'm probably the only other hustler on here. So, I mean, I'm all about that Zoom yeah. money. There are yeah. so many companies starting out right now that are, like, trying to get in on the Zoom market. I think I've, like, I have one called The Bash, which used to be called Gig Salad, uh, a Laugh Pit. Like, everyone's just, just trying to, like, turn this into a business model. And uh, I, yeah, there, was a, there was hopes that maybe we would be out of this thing sooner. And now that winter's coming, it's like, nope. They, they're going to try to make some money. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, I mean, comedy is coming back because um, we talked with, who's that guy from LA, Danny? Stephen Fury. We talked to Stephen Fury and he was saying that um, like full blown shows probably won't be back till mid 2021. Do you feel that's sort of how it's going? Yeah. You mean like, you mean like, a sold out room. I yeah. think kind of, I think, I think probably, I mean, people have been pushing it and I, I can't imagine it's going to move in the direction of people being more careful, but like, it's kind of interesting because it felt like New York was one of the, other than the States that like just willfully ignored it. <laughs> New York was one of the, it felt like one of the first that was careful, but started doing outdoor shows sooner. And by the end of the outdoor shows, most comedians, I'm not saying it's good, but most comedians, they'd hug hello, or they would, you know, they got lazy about the mic condoms because deep down, we all know they probably don't help. Uh, <laughs> we all know it deep down. It's, it's like, a, it, it, you need N95 masks, but this, this like thing I can see through, that's protecting it. We all know it's a little bit of theater. Um, and it's interesting because... I have friends in LA and I don't know what it's like there, but it feels like they're at the beginning of their outdoor show phase where everyone's sanitizing the mic or everyone has their own mic. Like that's something that in New York, eventually people just went. Yeah. <laughs> and so I know this is a podcast. They shrugged. They said, you know, what the fuck? Okay. I left my mic at home. What am I not going to perform? And, uh, and it's a mix. I still know people who don't leave their apartment at all. And they're probably making a morally superior decision. And I, I think a friend of mine said, like, he realized he's, he's more comedian than good person, where it's like, <laughs> and, and we're all seeing that. We're all seeing that. <laughs> I was on the truck bed show, you know, everyone on that truck bed show, we all looked at each other like, we're, we're bad. We're bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, yeah. Yeah, whatever. I don't fucking care. I'm going to 
Do what well, I there can. There you go. You're back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't fucking care. That's the definition. I hear you though. I can't judge. You know, I, 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 it was one of those things where in the beginning I was very like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, you're going to go to church right now? You're, oh, you need to go to church. And I then, say that anyway, but of course. that was pre-COVID. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. I, you know, I worry about those, those priests because, you know, coronavirus can be asymptomatic in little boys. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. well, and, the, and the parents aren't even letting their little boys go to fucking service. They're just, they're having to go to Boy Scout meetings to get them or something. I don't know. There you go. Those, those boys everywhere. By the way, I see you post a lot of political stuff. Can you see Rob's background? Oh, very nice. I didn't get the reference until you said that. That's great, though. I love it. Do you guys uh, have any like, questions? What? Did you see the thing that happened today? No. Uh, I mean, there's so today. much. There was, there was something very specific. That, I don't know what he, he was a Republican. I don't know what his position was, but some government position, not a senator, though. And he replied to his own tweet. He, he's a white guy. And he oh, replied yes. to his own tweet being like, <laughs> I, I, as a black gay man, can I just say that you know obama did it and clearly he was he he has an account where he pretends to be a gay black man who replies to his things and, and like i'm a gay black man and i support this conservative oh, wow. viewpoint and he tweeted it <laughs> as himself and then he then he wrote underneath he just said oh sorry i was quoting something someone had sent me i apologize if that wasn't clear <laughs> And now, like, they, I think some, I, I'm catching up on it, but they found some gay black Republican willing to say, I actually did send that to him. And it's, Whatever. This, it's this insane that we're all, it's, I think what's crazy is the number of people that you're like are, are just lying, but they're playing this game because there's enough people who believe it. But part of you is like, but what if no one believes it? What if no one believes it and we're all just pretending it's just so crazy it's just a crazy time i mean we as long as the person that says it believes it then it's true right that's what my ex-boyfriend said as long as you believe it it's true wow. <laughs> you know i tell a lot of like i have a i'm trying to figure this out as a comedian i have a lot of like autobiographic they're autobiographical jokes but they're not true and i mix them in with like true stuff and then i'll do like an interview or a podcast or something and they'll be like so tell us about this thing and i'm like oh i don't want to <laughs> i'm a liar like, that's a lie um but then i don't then I, I i can understand who is that comedian who got in trouble he said he he said he was like in Re the basement of the razanizi steve yeah Re Re ranazizi ranazizi yeah. steve ranazizi yeah the guy from yeah, the and it was like crazy. You're like, how did this happen? And and I feel like I'm two jokes away from it happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yeah. also had that Titanic joke um, uh -huh. I saw on Twitter. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, so I did today uh, something about a joke where I, I told a Titanic joke at a retirement community and because <laughs> she had a friend on it. And, and, and it comes from what, what I did, I, that just came from, I do have this joke about the Titanic. This guy was building something called Titanic two. And I had this bit about it and like someone wasn't liking it and they were old. And in the moment I said, you know, like, Oh, I'm sorry. It looks like you had a friend on it. I'm sorry. Something like that. And so I tweeted it. The tweet was doing well. And someone's like, you know, Fozzie bear did this clip in the Muppets in the 1970s. And I was like, oh. God, I, I couldn't even steal from someone good. I stole the fucking Fozzie <laughs> Bear. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, he got his whole act from Big Bird. Like, it's fucking yeah. <laughs> done. And, wow. and I, I, I think, you know, someone the other day, if I'm talking too much, tell me to shut the fuck up. But I, uh, someone the other day, I tweeted something where it was like, I wish Iraq would invade us and install democracy or something. And he, <laughs> but, but before you laugh, before I get credit for it, I should have said this first. He just tweeted without tagging me. He tweeted, he had tweeted something similar, uh, maybe about Syria, like two months before. And he just, he just put the two pictures together, implying that I had stolen it. And then thankfully someone tweeted underneath 
another account that had tweeted a similar joke three months before he had tweeted it. And rather than tweet like, hey, I'm a fucking cunt, I apologize for this. He just took down the tweet. And I was like, fuck you. You accused you accuse me of stealing from you. And the, this thing happened to you. And it's just like, we live in a world where there's, there's so many comedians and we're all putting everything on record. And uh, we're going to have to come up with some kind of code, some kind of system um, where how we, how we deal with this. Because I don't think that's good. If someone wrote me and they showed me they tweeted it before, I would delete it because that's, I mean, it's embarrassing. And if I did see that tweet, of course, I'd be humiliated if I if I accidentally did that. But a lot of people have the same fucking thoughts. You know what of I mean? Course. Like a lot, a million people have the same thoughts as, you know, you can't just be like, oh, well, then you stole that from me just because we have the same thought, just because we think alike. Sure. And I also think there's something to be said where it's like, until you, until everyone's heard it, if, if you and I found out we had a similar joke, part of it's like, does it really matter until someone is putting this on? I, I had a friend, um, uh, I, I think I can say his name. He'd be fine. His name's Lucas Connolly. He's a great comedian. And he had a joke where, where when he was heavier set, he was like, when I dress up as a Halloween character, I always go as the fat version of that character. So I'm not Wolverine. If I dress up like Wolverine, people think I'm fat Wolverine. And it was a very good joke. And there was another comedian, Kevin Barnett, who passed away, I believe, mm. last year. He had a joke um, where he said, I, I can only be the black version of a character. If I can't be Wolverine, I'm black Wolverine. And, and they, they had a conversation at some point and one of them said like, well, I guess I'll, I'll race, race you to see who gets it on TV first. Where there was right. like a time when media was less fractured, where, where do you tell your joke on The Tonight Show? If you told the joke on The Tonight Show, this is why everyone hated Robin Williams when he stole the joke. Because he told it on The Tonight Show and it was done. You know, that was his joke. But now we live in this world where, you know, if you release it on a self-released album, does that count as the same as The Tonight Show? I don't know. We're going to have to well, figure it out. And a lot of people, myself included, um, you know, definitely think they're way more important than they are. Like, oh, you stole my <laughs> joke. And like, now, now, you know, what are you going to do about it? And it's like, Jesus Christ, like, who even knows about you? No one. Like, calm it down. Like, you and I have a similar joke, uh, which I... I, I thought it was fucking great. I was like, oh, awesome. There's another pervert out there. Like, um, what was it? you were like, um, you know, in the bedroom, I don't like to be called dad. I like to be called son. Yeah. And, and I um, have a joke like that because um, I'm a phone sex operator and a lot of guys call in and ask me to be their moms. Uh, but, you know, I'm like, oh, I'll call you a son. Um, but it just made me think of it. But it's the lot yeah, of people yeah. have that same mind wave. You know, anything clean, anything that isn't like super personalized, clean as in like a clean premise or a clean joke. Um, like I, what, one of the bits that I do in this, this thing I recorded that I've been working on for years and I do that in sketch and whatnot. When I, when I read about the Titanic two, uh, it, it was the idea of if the band, like, thank God those passengers were so, you know, the band that plays as the ship goes down. I was like, yeah. those passengers were so lucky it wasn't a stand-up comedian. And I've been like, <laughs> and I, I worked on these, these jokes as the Titanic comedian, like these one-liners, like, knock, knock, who's there? The poor people trapped downstairs. Um, the poor people trapped downstairs. Who exactly. And it's like, but there's, there's another comedian named uh, uh, Matt Ruby who had a, had a joke that was similar where he didn't start with the Titanic. I started with the Titanic 2 as like the lead into this, but he just led into it a different way. And then I was in LA, I heard someone else do it. And I just had this feeling where I was like, I've been working on these one-liners as that comedian for like years. I felt like they were really strong and they did not have those particular one-liners. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. What, what am I going to get? Am I going to go to every show in the world and find it? And, but I could see them being pissed off, but I'm also like, who cares? They can keep doing theirs. No one knows who I am. Get the fuck um, over it. <laughs> you know, but I, I, I get, I mean, I remember was one of Amy Schumer, Amy Schumer got accused of all this like stealing stuff. And it, it, some of it was just like, no, these are just, she, they, they, they she said something about, Patrice O'Neill had all these bits about like different sex terms, like the, what was it? The pirate where you, 
you kick him, come in their eye and kick him in the leg or something. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, uh, well, did Patrice come up with that or was that a term? Because I remember hearing about that term in, in high school and Patrice obviously delivered it in a way that was amazing. But I'm like, well, why? Well, who, who cares? Patrice and Amy's fan base are way different. Right. Um, and it, I don't know. It's It sucks. But then there are real joke thieves. And I think that's not good either. Um, did you know that there was a club apparently that with Robin Williams, there was a green light in the back of the room that let the comedians know Robin had walked in. Yes. Um, the, the Throckmorton theater has that too here in California or had it. Yeah. Or Robin specifically. Yeah. It, well, it was, uh, he, that's his home club or that's where he was, um, all the time. It's in mill Valley. And, um, when he walked in, uh, a light would go on in the back, uh, you know, so that the person on the stage could see it and the people in the green room could see it. That's fucking wild. Was that like a light to say like, hey, don't do your good jokes. He's going to steal it yeah. or just, was it yeah, really? Or like, you know, because he would walk up to people and be like, hey, you can either sell me your jokes or write my jokes um, or I can just steal it. Either way, which one do you want to do? You want to make 50 bucks. And so, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Can you imagine that shit now? We really have evolved in terms of like, I, I've been watching the Comedy Store documentary on Showtime, and there's so many comedians that uh, I, I listen to. What's his name? Jimmy Walker, Dynamite, and he basically like he was funny, and he got a group of writers. Um, and I, I listened to his album recently, and it was it was like really solid jokes. Um, and that's just we don't work like that. I, I imagine lots of big comedians have writers' rooms, or it's a little more flexible, but we we kind of view it as this really like you got to write it yourself. <laughs> um, I have friends. If a friend gives me a tag, I always try to credit them, but I have friends where I feel like, yeah, I gave you this tag. And they're like, no, you didn't. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. It's <laughs> we helped each other. That's not the end of the world. Yeah. And it should be like that. You know, it shouldn't be like, Oh, well, I'm not going to speak up. Like I go to so many workshops where it's like, okay, we're working out jokes, but no one's like helping each other because they're like, oh, he might steal that. Or, and it's like, dude, what the fuck is the point in this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Sure. Are you in so, New York? Oh, I am in New York. Okay. Um, I'm going to South Carolina tomorrow, actually, to feature at a place called Comedy Cabana. Okay. And, uh, and then I'm going to go to LA next week. My mom and sisters live in LA and uh, Stand Up New York, which is a club here that kind of led, led the charge on outdoor shows. They stopped doing mostly outdoor shows here because it's getting starting to get cold, but they're going to try uh, in LA to kind of recreate the, at some point there were 50 shows a week going on. Um, yeah. And they're going to try to do that in LA. So I'm going to go there, hopefully be a part of some of those and then assess if, if I should go to the West coast for January and February, because it's miserably cold in New York and, if if it does if things keep being shut down this much it'll probably be pretty miserable to be here uh, vegas we'll is the spot to be uh just so you know like really for, for shows yeah, for stand-up for live stand-up yeah go to vegas really yeah why the outdoor shows or they're just break they're just doing indoor shows or they're doing indoor shows they're doing outdoor shows um there's i think off the top of my head i think there's 18 ongoing shows weekly right now i can I, i'll message you the the names of the guys putting on the shows but yeah and it's um, success like someone like me could go down and be like hi i'm here i'd love yeah, to I believe do so. show. <laughs> okay yeah. cool uh, oh, you, yeah, never yeah, you never know you never know <laughs> I, uh, I'll, I'll get you in contact with them. Thank so. you. I appreciate it. That'd be cool. So um, one thing, one thing I want to ask you about, cause I, I ran like, so part of this is I do research and I just Google people's names. I Google pictures. I came across, <laughs> you found, you found the, <laughs> I was going to make a terrible joke. You know, there's some jokes. I'm like, don't make this joke. What are you doing? And then they cut this podcast. I was going to be like, <laughs> never mind. Oh, I don't, I don't edit. So I had all sorts of ideas of like, Oh, you found the blank charge. Well, I don't think you can top this because I found you as a deli meat tray. Oh yes. Yes. That was a, <laughs> that was a sketch. My friend, Russell Daniels, I'm in a sketch team. I, I don't know if we're still a sketch team after this shit, but uh, it's called uncle function and his idea, you know, you you know, those human sushi trays. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was like, I was a, I was a new Brooklyn restaurant, but it was like for deli meat. It was a deli meat tray. And they find out basically you find out that the people eating are my ex-girlfriend's parents. And like, I find out my ex-girlfriend's getting married and I start like crying and the meat starts falling off of me. <laughs> and, and like, I'm humiliated. And the, the big, the big end is it's the father's birthday. So they have to do the birthday thing where I, f- I flip over, they put whipped cream in, on my ass and stick the candle in my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I will say um, there was that. And then there was you in a speedo. You sir have a damn good body. Oh, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Danny, you need to check it out because, I mean, he is ripped like Jesus. I don't look at my cousins like that. Okay, calm it down. Look at my cousins. Wow. <laughs> I, uh, I do try to, to strip down as, as much as I can for its easy comedic effect. <laughs> well, yeah, I imagine whipped cream on your ass and then a candle. Like, was it through the cheeks? <laughs> like like they're they're really good friends so they they push it in a little more than i'm comfortable with <laughs> um i even once had there was a guy there was some guy who like an older guy who wrote me online sometimes and he asked he was like how much to send me the underwear you're wearing in this yeah Ooh. I get I just, just like that all the time. I, I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I don't know. Something about it. Uh, maybe eventually. We'll see how the rest of this year goes. <laughs> it's when they ask you to season it, that's when you're in trouble. Well, you I'll tell you more. another. <laughs> one of my, my merch, I have this bit. It won't be funny out of context, but it ends with like only owning uh, uh, one towel. Or some something, and then the towel is underneath my air conditioner. The other ta- the other is a hand towel I use to masturbate, and it's it's uh, it, the joke ends with me being like, so when I shower, I have two options: moist or crunchy. So I sell these <laughs> I sell these hand towels that say moist or crunchy, and it has my my handle and my my face. And this this guy, same guy, he was like, how much for a used towel? How much for a crunchy <laughs> towel? And I was like, I just cannot. I can't. I, I I always think I'm like loose and free, and then I see that I'm like, no, that's, that's wrong. That's <laughs> Twenty funny. years from now, someone goes, "You're my daddy." Uh, exactly. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How are you conceived? I came on some merch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I ordered. I ordered. Fi- I was running out. And this is ambitious, but I ordered like 500 towels because it's way cheaper if you get it in bulk. Mm-hmm. And someone stole it. I Someone stole the package. And I'm like, they're going to have somewhere. Someone has 500 towels with my Twitter on it, my Twitter handle, my face and moisture crunching. Your face is on it? <laughs> like like a little. I'll, 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 I'll just, yeah, show us a towel, please. I think I'd have a tough time making it crunchy if your face is on it. Oh, no, it'd be even better. <laughs> well, the good thing is uh, he thought ahead. It's white, so it would hide it very well. Maybe I can no, use that as a tag where I'll be like, you can buy it. You can, you can come on my face. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Oh, he can, bullseyes on the glasses. I was about to say, give you a dirty librarian. <laughs> <laughs> They were probably pissed when they got home and opened up that fucking package. They were like, what the fuck? What am I doing with 500 goddamn towels? I feel real bad for them. <laughs> I, uh, I'm so pissed. The, the, my packages keep getting stolen, and it's, it's one of these things where the landlord's like, yeah, it keeps happening. Don't know what to do. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, so that's the end? That's, <laughs> so just no, just no packages. Okay, cool. <laughs> It's, it's astounding. I don't know what to do. I'm very in a PO box. It. It's yeah. probably your landlord. <laughs> Maybe that is such a New York response. I'm sorry. Just be like, yeah, they get stolen. What are you gonna do? <laughs> what are you gonna do, <laughs> Tron? You were gonna ask a question. No, I was gonna say, is he is he sending it through Amazon? I mean, because I know they have the Amazon. Well, Amazon has so. been pretty good so far. I mean, I, I don't like it. I don't like having things stolen, having to call and wait an hour, but Amazon has been pretty good about just like replacing it, which okay. honestly makes me think like I could probably 
<laughs> yeah, you have like a fifteen hundred dollar limit. You have up to fifteen hundred dollars before they red flag your account. For a year hey, or for a lifetime? Fifteen hundred sounds good. A oh year. yeah, a year. Well, uh, pretty good. I, just, I don't. I think a year. A year, from what I know. Because if it's lifetime, that could be rough. I don't know if it's lifetime. Well, it's. I mean, because what happens? I live on the third floor. And I put special instructions. Please don't leave it in the front area. Bring it up to the third floor. They don't. And they're never going to. And it's, it's like, well, so <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> I used to do deliveries, man. If you tell me to walk up three stairs. Of course. Yourself. Yeah. I understand. I understand. But what do I do? What do a I P.O. Do? box. <laughs> Everyone's just telling me to go fuck myself. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to order anymore. That's it. No more. Make friends That's with it. someone on the first floor. Until you Literally. move. Yeah. I'm Give sure. A towel. I'm sure you have that stereotypical old lady that doesn't go anywhere that Dude. knows everybody's business. Have her get your packages. Send your packages to the creepy old guy. <laughs> well, I, he would I'm watch like, those things like they were gold, man. <laughs> I'm I'm casually I'm kind of casually seeing someone who lives close to me and they have they their place is safer and I get so stressed though because I I ordered these I just moved and I ordered these like uh, nice cushions I'm trying to upgrade and but the problem is they're it's from Etsy it's not getting there in three months and I'm like what happens if we break up like oh. I just, like I'm I'll just be so fucked. And you gotta hold on. You gotta hold on for three I remember months. the first big breakup I had, like in high school. We had made plans like that summer to go to her parents had a beach house. And I remember when she dumped me, I had this this reasoning where I was like, well, "You can't break up with me. We're going to the beach house in three months." Yeah. <laughs> like I saw it as like a well that that plan set so we can't break up now. <laughs> and, uh, and life teaches you fast. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys have any questions for him before i go on i don't want to hog it all wow thanks i mean for I, have, replying. I, I have quest i have questions but i think you and i have the same questions so we'll see what your questions are first no you go go danny let's let's have some italian banter hey yo hey oh hey that um was, that was pretty racist of me i'm sorry <laughs> yeah you fucking whitey um wow. anyways uh <laughs> Have you always done comedy in New York? Where are you from? Like, what's your get down? So I I was one of those actor types. I went to college for musical theater. I saw and, your dance uh, moves. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, ha I have not taken, I used, to, I used to take a weekly hip hop class and I haven't taken one in eight months. It was, I was at advanced beginner. I think I'm probably back to beginner <laughs> once this shit is over with. Um, so I went to college for musical theater I took a class at Caroline's Comedy Club uh, the summer of my junior year, and uh, it felt good. You know, one of those classes where it, the, the, it's more useful in that, like, it forces you to, oh, I got to do five minutes in six weeks. But you do it in front of, like, a packed crowd, you murder, and you're like, I'm amazing. <laughs> and I went back to college, and uh, there was a stand-up scene. I went to University of Miami in Florida, and... There was a scene, but I wasn't part of it at all. I just, I didn't, I wrote an hour and I did it for like my friends and you know, I murdered because it was all friends and it was like, it was 80% of it was sex. Just like, it was pretty much like the story of every single time I had sex, I had turned into a story. <laughs> and uh, it, it, I, it went well because... It, you know, it was just like when, when someone you know talks about getting peed on once. You're like, oh, my God, this is hilarious uh, yeah. that he's saying this. So I just thought in my head, like, like many actors do, like I'm like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an actor slash the third hyphen is stand-up mm -hmm. comedian. And um, I, w I moved to New York. I was just acting. I would do occasionally like a bringer show at Caroline's or a bringer show at Gotham. And this was the time when those shows would be sold out and you would just crush. Uh, and, and so I thought in my head, I, I did like two open mics at the Creek in the Cave and the, the, they can be rough open mics. So what would happen is I would bomb at the open mics. I would crush at these shows. And I was so delusional that in my head I said, oh, well, I, I, my comedy only works if it's like a sold out crowd. <laughs> like it, and it, that, it just, it happens when, when, when you're not friends with comedians, it's just easy to, you go to open mics, you're like, well, why aren't the jokes working here? 
they obviously yeah. all suck. <laughs> and uh, and then eventually I wrote like I wrote a play that had a lot of like storytelling and jokes kind of. And I had a friend see it and be like, you should do this full time. And I was 27. I had some TV credits as an actor, but it, it was it was stagnating to a certain degree. I wasn't like a, a series regular on something. Um, and I had to have that conversation with myself where I was like, do I want to do this? If I do this, I'm going to have to be out most nights. I was kind of uh, I'm more of a hermit. I like to be home at night and just watch my shows or whatever. And it felt like a, a real, like, am I going to give up all my nights? And I decided to go for it. And within a year, I was just, you know, the competition of it ex is exciting. And the, cl the climb, especially in the beginning, you really feel yourself like getting better. And before I knew it, I was like, I was one of those dudes getting home at two in the morning. And uh, I had just adjusted to that life. Yeah. and uh biggest mistake of my existence <laughs> and uh that's why when coronavirus hit i like i was very happy with stand-up i felt was feeling good i was about to like do four weekends in a row headlining little things but in detroit and um well, i forget i was going somewhere else but i i was just it was a full weekend four weekends of headlining i bought all this merch i'd finally figured out merch that actually sold sold I, I was going to lose money, but maybe with merch, I'd break even. And then just, it all stopped. <laughs> so I, uh, I just hope, I, I really just hope when this comes back, I just, I just want to, I want to get to a place where I'm doing hours or just long sets. And yeah. um, now that I finally kind of recorded something, I feel like I did, I do feel more like, okay, I don't have to be a crazy perfectionist. You know, my head, it's, it's like, oh, you want the first hour on tape to be like the perfect, this is who I am hour. This is, and, and now I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I just want to, once the jokes are good, I just want to figure out a way to get them out there. And if industry success comes along, that's great. But if I end up being one of those comedians that like figures out their own fucking tour and just get more followers. Sure. Um, and, I, and that's what I think I learned from this year. Cause you're like, well, I'm not going to make any industry progress right now. Uh, so I better make do, do with what I have. Well, let's, let's talk about your special. Cause I was curious if um, you find it's hard to promote it due to COVID because usually people do specials and then they go on tour and do all that shit. Are you having issues with promoting? By the way, the specials on Amazon prime, it's called shelf life and it is a hoot and a half. That's funny. <laughs> Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, you know, promoting it. I, I think all this shit made me like <laughs> figure out what do I want to do with TikTok and what do I want to do with Instagram? What do I do, do with Twitter? And it's like brutal. Like I, I spend an hour and a half or two hours figuring out whatever joke I'm going to put on. And maybe it's not two hours, but it feels like it's just emotional weight of like, all right, I got to pick what joke am I going to put on TikTok? And then I record it a hundred times. Cause I just think it's always bad or there are car honks. And then I add the captions and then I think, Oh fuck, what's, what's, what's the little caption on the thing. <laughs> but it has helped. It has definitely increased my, my ability I, I was nervous when I released the trailer and stuff. I'm like, will my comedian friend share it? Um, am I respected? Because a lot of this is just like the, do your peers respect you or not? Right. Um, I told someone last night, like all it takes for me to admire you as a comedian is if you're good and like kind of cold to me, I'm like, oh, you're a genius. And you don't <laughs> like me. You don't like me because I'm a fucking hack. And of course you don't like me. And I have all these like, <laughs> basically people who aren't like further along than me, but I'm like, they're amazing and they're genius. And I'm sure they think I, I'm so fucking faces and big noises. <laughs> and uh, it felt good that I, I felt like there were comedians that I respected who, who shared the special, who watched it. And you're like, wow, that's, I know what it means to watch a special. There's so much shit out there. Especially and, um, a comic special. Like, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Like a lot of times I'm like, oh, I don't want to 
like we were talking about earlier, like I don't want to steal someone's joke or I don't want to have the same mindset. So I, I try not to watch, but I love comedy. So I'm like, fuck if, So when I watch my friends on whatever, I'm just like, fuck. But like, if I respect you, I'll watch it. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I like to listen to like one album a day and it can be from any era. I'm more of a listener than I am like watching it. Mm. Um, but I love like, especially like with the comedy store documentary, every time there's some new comedian, I see if they released an album and it's uh it's it's very cool because some of them are great some of them are bad it's a really interesting i mean the documentary is a little like clearly the people who made it love the comedy store and it shows i want a vicious i want to hear from the people who were fucked you know um but it's it's fast like you know michael keaton it's he's talking about his stand-up comedy career and uh and they just covered Andrew Dice Clay. And it's just like fascinating. I, I saw last night, Andrew Dice Clay, I guess, one of the reasons his success stopped, at least the way the documentary painted it, was during the AIDS crisis. And he had all these homophobic jokes. And he, like in terms of whatever you want to call cancel culture, it was the first one where it was like, we have old video footage, or this was your act. This is what you're known for. The public conversation has shifted, and this is no longer cool. And despite he been selling out stadiums, it became to be looked at like you're the you're wrong. And you see him on it was Ar, Ar, Arsenio Hall, and Arsenio's like, so you know, tell me, how do you feel about these old jokes? And all of a sudden, this guy who's kind of cool, he kind of meets him on his level, and he's like, well, you know, I, I, I. I I don't feel hatred and, and no one gave a fuck. No one was going to forgive him. I don't know if he's worthy of forgiveness or not, but you definitely see how I was curious. I was like, I was like, what could he have done to make people feel like he had changed or would he do what many contemporary uh, edge edge Lord comedians do and just lean into it and go, fuck you. I'm going to make even more. And maybe it would have worked. I don't know. I mean, it worked for Louis, like his last special uh, that he didn't necessarily, like he just released it on his website. And he talks about like, you know, fuck you guys for knowing my thing, my sexual thing. And he like totally addresses it and talks about like retards and talks about uh, all kinds of stuff that you're not supposed to talk about. And I, I loved it, but I mean, I don't know how it's, if it's well received. But. Yeah. I mean, I think just for some people it's, I, like any no no comedian could watch that special and not go oh this is one of the greatest like crafters of of chunks in the world I mean just insane but like it, it's hard because I, I certainly there's lots of edge edge lord folks where or people were like I feel like on Twitter I'm like you're harassing people or or it feels like it feels like you're a white supremacist I don't think you're making like race jokes. But then I see like people were upset about Chappelle's monologue because he made that joke about Freddie Mercury and they're like, there's nothing funny about AIDS. And I, there's probably, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? there is. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, like, also, wow. I'm just like, I'm just like, he's not making fun of people who died. He's making an analogy. And I'm also, there's a thing where I'm like, especially when it's white people doing it. I'm like, really? You, think you have license to like, Tell a black man what he's allowed to talk about. They're everyone's like, proxy to be offended. Yeah. 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 It's wild. I had a, I had a, I had a friend, a brilliant, brilliant comedian friend, and she's, she's a lesbian and she makes jokes about bi people. And like, you know, she's kind of like, people were mad at her for these bi jokes. And I was like, I didn't know bi Trump's lesbian in the, the hierarchy of who can be offended, it blew me away. I was just yeah. like, oh, I thought she was allowed to talk about whatever in this yeah. arena. And uh, I, I got very nervous. I had a joke um, that I, I kept in the special, so clearly I ration, uh, rationalized it to myself, where I said, my roommate moved from China to America in January. That's like boarding the Titanic from the iceberg. And like, <laughs> <laughs> and someone retweeted it and said like, this is the problem. This is why there's all these hate crimes against Asian people right now. And it was like, why? Oh, you're the main reason. You're the problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 it, and, and then I made the, I made the, I always admire Anthony Jeselnik, the way he always handled controversies, mm -hmm. which I don't know if it would work anymore, but it's like, 
it's kind of like if you, and again, I, it, it, this could be the end of my career someday if I ever get big, but it's like, always be joking. Like if you enter the arena of being serious, then you're going to lose because I'm not, I'm not, because then, then we're talking about the joke seriously. So like right. just if, either don't say anything or have a joke response. That's a good joke. And to, to essentially to say, I am a comedian. If it's a joke. Start- Oh, yeah. Well, but, what Jeselnik like, yeah. does well is you were talking about lean into it and just really just go with it. He leans into it so far that it just becomes farcical so that you couldn't possibly think he really believes this stuff. And if you do, of you're course. just a simple moron. Because he's not so. like that at all. Exactly. Well, I don't know him personally, but I, I can't imagine anyone's like that and yeah. be able to function in society. But, you know, which but makes it that that's why it's so good. With, with like, and what's, what's upsetting is that people just don't understand. It's more just like you don't have a system in place. So like James Gunn, who's the, was the director of, uh, of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Is that James Gunn? Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, he, he lost his job, which they then gave back to him later, <laughs> of directing the thing because he had these old bad jokes uh, 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 that were like a lot of like pedophile jokes. And they did the same thing with Anthony Jeselnik. They, they got all these tweets together and they're like, look at this pedophile. And he was like, thanks for collecting the, my greatest hits. <laughs> I think, I think what's so frustrating, there, there's twofold. There's one's frustrating where I'm like, I do think there are people who are not making jokes. They're just doing hate speech or who have a fan base where I'm like, I do think you're just kind of spewing stuff that a, it isn't funny. So you've already lost like my, my desire to defend you. And, and B it's like, you're dealing with people who do act on these impulses. Um, so I, I don't want to be supportive of them, but then you do of course feel like there's people that are, that are like willfully misinterpreting things or in the case of Chappelle, it's like, okay. So you, so you don't like the joke. Like, you think that joke, it's, it's also like if you're a comedian, you're like, I've seen wild shit. You think that was bad? <laughs> no, that was bad? That's nothing. Yeah. And I don't know what to do. I don't know what the solution is. And I certainly feel like a certain degree of nervousness and, um, you know, who knows? It, it also is just a matter of like, well, this is just, it's, 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 it's the wild West. Louis CK is obviously not a great example because he got in trouble for other things, but they, you know, they, the- they, they, they pulled up the HBO documentary where he said the N word. And it was like, yeah, it was on HBO for a decade and everyone watched it and they, they, they thought it was used in the appropriate context. And you can have a conversation about these things, but this idea of like, aha, it's like, <laughs> don't, point at, don't point at him, point at yourself because you watch that shit. There is always this thing with like, it's the same with, with like a, a Woody Allen or an R. Kelly. It's almost like, it's not that you shouldn't get upset or try to uh, prosecute people for ills, but we knew about it <laughs> yeah. for a long time. And there is no moment of looking in the mirror and going, hey, maybe you fucking suck too. <laughs> we, we all knew about R. Kelly. There I was still a listen to R. Kelly. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. I was Up and Grind is fucking amazing. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't play D, I can't play that DJ shows. <laughs> yeah. And I, look, I'm, I'm all, look, I, I do think like, yeah, we, we, I think him being in trouble and, and going to getting punished for it, I think it's, it's the right move. But no one ever like takes the moment of being like, a, oh, maybe I'm putting all this anger on him because I also feel a little guilt that I just didn't care. Lady Gaga was doing songs with him on fucking SNL. Uh, you know, doing do what you want to my body. And it's like, <laughs> and she, she apologized and blah, blah. But it's like, we have to acknowledge that we're all, uh, we're, we're all complicit. Um, and if you're not taking it into account, you're, you're just a fucking liar. And it's, <laughs> it's hard to res- respect if you were involved. I know that um, Kevin Hart, he got, he got dinged for and lost the, uh, um, Hosting gig to award show. Yeah, to the Oscars. To 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 that award show. To the (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes. Come down to this now. (laughs) Um, 
Yeah, he was going to give out CYO trophies at the end of the basketball season. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, because, um, you know, you said you're, you know, when you make it big. I mean, you were in Hustlers, you were in Blue Bloods a lot. We, our old co host, um, he also did some acting. And I just want to confirm is it as cushy as he says? Because he would be on set for maybe. 10 hours and work maybe 30 minutes and make a grip ton of money. It's not always a grip ton of money. It can be uh, like, like hustlers. I, that was one of those where I was on set. I think I actually reported at 10 PM, which is rare, usually super early, but we didn't film until like one in the morning. But then I'm, I'm on set that scene. That's one quick line. It was like, I was, I was working for 15 minutes and, you know, I get, I get uh, uh, probably, I think the day rate, because something you, you can get a quote when you're famous enough and get paid more, but the standard day rate is like about a grand minus 10% agent, 10% manager. And then recently I got like another 600 bucks. And that's like a mix of like, you know, whatever, whatever my residuals for were from it playing on the airplane or it, uh, it, it going to whatever, whatever streaming service was- bought it. Was that the one with Big J as the DJ? Yes, yes. Big J. Big J. Uh, I actually did a show at Mohegan Sun with Big J, and we we talked about it briefly. We weren't on set the same day. Um, I fucked Big J. Oh, a long, okay. a long, long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> she's yeah, so yeah. proud of that. That's my that's my biggest credit. What? I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, no. Um, yeah, and he's hey, back great. on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, I, I just gave him a hand job, but you know, hey. <laughs> we all start um, out somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, different things can pay well. I, I was, uh, I did these general electric commercials for two years and like that was the payday. And it was like, it was, I was the lead of six national commercials. Every time it airs, I get a little bit of money. I did wow. corporate gigs. So they would fly me to Vegas. I would go on stage and be like, I'm the guy. And that was it. And like, yeah, it can be, <laughs> those can be super cushy, but then you don't work for two years. Um, and a lot of, a, a lot of stuff has been reduced payment wise because these streaming services have kind of, fuck things up where there's more stuff that's non-union or they had to come up with new contracts to keep them union. So like I'm i I'm on this show called bonding on Netflix and it's a small part, but originally it wasn't for Netflix. It was for like some streaming website in France. And I filmed two days. I think I got two fifty a day. And then you, I find out, you know, Netflix is buying it. And, and I, I'm my, my, my two days split over the course of three episodes And like, if it was a network TV show, three episodes, you know, I could make three grand. Or if I was booked as a guest star, I could make 6,000 times three. I could make 18,000 bucks. But but it moving from whatever contract I signed for this French thing to Netflix, I didn't get a dime. And so I'm going on Netflix and I'm seeing like they're advertising the show super heavily. And I'm like, I was paid at the end of the day, 350 bucks. And (laughs) Uh and People are seeing me all over the world. And so in, in those cases, it's like, well, if I worked every day, this would be a, a fine living. But sometimes it's not a good system per se, but these big paydays can sometimes balance out the fact that especially for the first decade, if not forever, you're not working a lot. Hmm. Yeah, he uh, his his acting gigs were few and far between. And what's funny is he did, um, he doesn't listen so I can make fun of him. He did a Geico commercial and uh, he was like, Oh, it's going to be on. It's going to be on. And then he ended up getting cut from the Geico commercial. (laughs) I remember he messaged me and was like, "Never mind." (laughs) I, I recently had an episode. I was on a, a show on Apple TV and I had like, it was considered a guest star which is just, it's, it becomes meaningless, but it's like, it was a good role. And I had a chunky scene and uh, this woman plays music at the bar. And then I go up to her and I was her ex-boyfriend and I'm, I'm watching it. It finally got released. I, I see her playing. I'm in the audience. You see me in the audience, just watching. And then they leave the bar and I go, Oh, are they going to come back to the bar? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, 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 I, 
and, I, and I, there's like 20 more minutes of the show and I'm just like, please tell me they go back to the bar. And no, oh. they just cut my scene. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> and it's just like, it, it feels just, and luckily I didn't make a big stink about it, but I, it felt so humiliating. Just that. My, my sister um, was going to be on, I hope, I think she's, uh, she was going to be a backup dancer for a, a big performer on Saturday Night Live. And it was like her first, it was like a gigantic gig. She missed one of her finals at college to like go to the callback. Like it was a risk. Oh. She booked it. And it was, it was a big SNL show. It was like one of, it was a big guest and it was a memorable show. They rehearsed it. She signed the contract Friday night. She's finally like, I'm comfortable telling my closest friends. They, they, they move it to the stage and turns out the band's a little bigger than they planned. They have to cut two of the four dancers and she's one of the two that were cut. And she calls me like at one in the morning on Friday night and she's just sobbing. And I was like, I knew immediately something like that happened. I was like, honey, what? And, and, and she was cut. And those two dancers that stayed went with, did I say Lady Gaga? I already said it, Lady Gaga too to Japan, to oh, California, oh, to the oh. Super Bowl, and- To the Super Bowl I, too? To the Super Bowl. Oh, and especially with dance, I mean, dance is, is even worse because there's just this clock on it. Um, and it was so hard. It was, it was very hard to even know how to comfort her because I was like, I've never come that degree of close that I was, I was rehearsing. And she was dancing with Lady Gaga. That's fucking amazing. It's amazing. But I mean, imagine you, you see these dancers who then have a career after that. And the only reason you didn't is because the, the band was a little bigger. Oh. And, and there's no, yes, did, did the choreographer, I'm sure, like clock it and go like, oh, she's good. Maybe I'll have her next project. But this, we know this business, it moves so quickly. You have, yeah. You're dealing with a million moving pieces. You don't have time to go back and make sure you take care of this person you knew for six hours because you fucked him over. I, I think of all the time with acting where you're like, you wish they let you know when you didn't book a part. You just find out because you see the commercial or the TV show and there's the person doing it. But then if you ever work on a project, you go like, I don't have I don't have time to get back to every single person. And maybe that's not an excuse. And maybe that's, that's where unions, I've always thought that like you should get a payment for an initial audition. Like it's not a job interview because the whole system is based on you, you seeing options. And so I'm like, the onus is on you. You're the one bringing people in, but that seems unfathomable. You know, it seems as, as unlikely as universal healthcare. Um, <laughs> It's, I used to take good, my but... <laughs> I used to take my daughter to like go sees, you know, when she was little because someone was like, Oh, she's beautiful. And I was like, Oh, she could make me money. Like, so I'd drive from Sacramento to San Francisco. I'd take the day off work. She was a baby. We would go fucking just to go sit in a room full of fucking babies and like just in case maybe. And then I'd be yeah. like, oh, okay, well, we got what we needed, go home. And it's like, fuck, that was a whole day. But uh yeah. And, and it never fucking worked out. So fuck acting. Just do porn instead. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, if you got a body like his, yeah. I mean, mine. <laughs> I'm going to have to check it out. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just going to have to take I a look almost, at it. When I first moved to New York, I almost like ended up doing what was, in retrospect, softcore porn. There was a Cinemax show called Girl's Guide to Depravity. And... I, I, I wasn't, I just wasn't like, I wasn't aware enough to realize like, oh, this is what soft porn is. Cause I was, I don't watch a lot of soft porn, porn. but it, the, the initial audition, like it was one of these things where I was a new actor and suddenly I was auditioning for a series regular and filmed in, um, oh, what's it called? What's above your port? No, fuck. What's, what's the a- States near Germany? Not States. What countries are near Germany? France, uh, uh, um, uh, no, Switzerland, Vienna, uh, Austria, Norway, the fingers. Yeah, that's oh, sweet. Fuck. The beer is cheaper than the water. That's what I remember. Great, very cultured group. So I, I would say I, uh, Germany. Then, if the beer is cheaper than water, 
Uh, something I'll remember, but so it filmed what? there. It paid, you know, 5,000 a week, <clears throat> but the initial audition, all you did was you walked in the room, stripped down to your underwear. If you were a woman stripped down to your underwear, no bra, I, you turn and there's a casting director, her assistant, and then like four Japanese businessmen. I don't know what the relationship <laughs> they were. The and you turned, you pulled down your underwear, showing your ass until they said, pull it back up. And that was it. And it was, a, it was amazing. I was there and I was seeing all these, I was seeing a lot of women that I just don't think this is what they would normally do, but we're desperate actors. And after like two years of not working, you're like, this is a role. Sure. I'll, I'll fucking, I'll do it. You, you <laughs> totally understand how Harvey Weinstein happened, how all these things happened because you, you might think you have principles, but then like you see your friends start succeeding and you're like, I don't know what, how the fuck I'm going to, <laughs> what am I doing? I'm, I'm not, I haven't worked in two years and you get desperate. And, uh, I, I got to the final, I got to the chemistry reads for this show and where I was with the other actor who, and it was weird cause I had like seen her naked on screen having fake sex and we're doing this chemistry read and thank God I didn't get it because, <laughs> and also like the guys were ripped on this show in a way that I'm, that I am not. <laughs> Uh, there was like a nerdy character on the show. I hate it when this happens. It's like a nerdy guy. And I'm like, oh, I could play that. And then he takes <laughs> off his shirt and you're like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I, I auditioned for this movie once and it was like this, it was, it was some romantic comedy and it was supporting. It felt like, I think I could actually get this. This feels right up my alley. He was like nerdy, he was like a tech guy. And then like page 98 of a 100 page script, they're at a pool and it's like Derek takes off his shirt. Everyone does a triple take. His body is all caps, rock solid. <laughs> what the fuck? Why? There were no scenes of him going to a gym. Why does he need to be rock solid? Why do you need that in a movie? That you, you're hoping they're gonna, the, the people watch go, oh, I'm turned on. Okay, this was good movie. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch porn. I never get that. It's like if you want to, if you want sex, watch a porn. Why does why does it have to be sexy in the drama you're watching? Why does Schindler's List do they all need to be like kind of good looking? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of messed up. I thought about it. <laughs> Holy fuck! You're fucking <laughs> spectacular. <laughs> I adore you. This is great. <laughs> But isn't that the same thing with the women? They basically always had a nerdy one play off, and then when they they she basically takes off her glasses and dress up a little bit, and like it was like, oh my gosh, look at her now, mm -hmm. she's so beautiful. It's like, it's like, nah. looks the same, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember I, <laughs> I told a woman that story once about the movie, and she was like, now you know what it's like to be a woman every day, and I was like, oh, that was easy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, when you, you when you first started talking about it, I was like, "Oh shit, could he be one of these guys that got tricked into that tickle porn guy?" <laughs> I know, I have a friend who did it. There no you know. shit, I have a friend who did it. He wasn't tricked. There, there was this guy where he just got people to the very popular video series. He'd restrain your hands, and people would tickle you. And sometimes your shirt would be off. Your shirt might be off. And I had a friend who did it. Uh, I think it's public, but I won't say it just in case. <laughs> but then it got twisted after where he like, I think there were accusations, I believe, that he would be like, I'll send it to your work if you don't give me yes. money or something. Uh, but yeah, people do. That's why I'm always sympathetic. There was one, uh, I remember a while ago, there was a huge lawsuit where this guy, it was like a prank show, a prank movie, and they got actors, and in the audition room, it was just actresses, they got them to, to do like Nazi salutes, Nazi marches, blackface. And they had signed some kind of contracts before the audition. Cause you know, they'll give you like NDAs or whatever. And you just sign them. You don't have time to read these fucking things. It should be illegal. I believe, yeah. but they signed them and they just ended up putting it in theaters. These oh, videos, of these young actors who dream of having a career and they're doing blackface. They're doing blackface. They're done. And they sued and they lost the lawsuit. They said, you signed and you said it was okay. And uh, fuck it. it reminds me of that South Park episode with the iPhone update. And they're like, oh, well, now you're going to, you know, like get sewn on to that guy's mouth and that guy's mouth. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, every time, every time. Who was, the, who was it in the show that was like, wait, you, you don't read the agreement? 
I don't even fucking remember. I just remember it was like ass to mouth, and I was like, oh god, this is horrible. It's just so funny. Just so funny. The, just this person being like, what do you mean you don't read the agreement? You just yes. sign an agreement? Like, what are you out of your fucking mind? Duh, I sign it. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Oh, that's so crazy. You know, someone that was in that tickle thing. Cause I watched a big documentary on it and yeah, he would threaten, he would basically extort them and then um, sell them as like porns, which I didn't know was a fetish until I saw it. Obviously tickle is a fetish. A fetish. Everything that, is a fetish. Yeah. That's, another, that's what I fetish. think. Like if that happens, you just got to own it. I would post the tickling video myself. Yeah, exactly. It, Who the fuck cares? You know, that's the only, that's the only option you have. You yeah. own so out yourself before outed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I know you're a busy man. So, you have you listened to the podcast at all before? No. <laughs> uh, I, I went through half of one and then I forgot to get back to it. But why? What's now? Are you gonna tickle me? <laughs> Take your shirt off. Take your shirt off. Show us your ass. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see that chest here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, we we do this ultra popular thing called Inside the Comic Studio. Brilliant. Yes. Um, before we get into it, though, um, plug your special, plug any dates you got coming up. This will be out on YouTube Saturday and then a cool. podcast on Monday. Great. Um, so, but special, it's called Shelf Life. It's on Amazon Prime. It's free if you have Amazon Prime. Uh, if not, it's available for rental. And uh, yeah, it starts with like a six minute little documentary about like what it was to do all these crazy outdoor shows and write new material. And it's like a good 30 minute size special. You won't get uh, too tired before it's done. And um, yeah, check it out. Find me online, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, at John Marco Cerezi. Um, by the time you hear this, I'm going to be in LA, uh, <laughs> November 18th to November 22nd. I'm going to be at uh, DC, DC Comedy Loft the weekend after Christmas. If the world is reopened, it's very tentative, but uh, that's where I'm from originally. I, uh, you know, if you're in Vegas or LA, I, I have this plan that I'm going to be on the West Coast January and February. So I'm around. You want to book me? I will, I will travel. Uh, I, I, the more time, the less money you need to pay me. But maybe I shouldn't say that. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's me. All right, Danny will hook you up on the Vegas thing. She is Yeah, we'll in probably there. cross paths. I appreciate it. That'd be awesome. Yeah. All right, uh, Rob, go. Yeah, my side project, Stand Up Dad's Podcast. I do that with my buddy Mike. We talk about parenting crap. New episodes come out every Sunday. Get it wherever finer podcasts are sold. Nice. Danny. Uh, you can find me at Rad Chick Forever. Nick will put the link in the thing. Um, like a good boy. Um, yeah, that's it. I've got shows coming up. I've got a lot of shit going on. You can find out about it on my Facebook or Instagram. Instagram's probably better. Yeah. All right. I still put your Twitter link in there, but you're never on it. Yeah. Why don't you just put my <laughs> OnlyFans instead? Motherfucker? That is on there as well. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> uh, Sharon, what do you got? I uh, got an I Am Big podcast. I Am Big podcast comes out every Tuesday. Uh, the, right now we're doing real poetry, which is basically doing um, films that have poetry in them. The next one we're going to do right now is Poetic Justice. So I was just going to say that. <laughs> you better be doing Basketball Diaries, too. I think there's poetry in that. He writes in a, a pun? He writes in a book. Right? <laughs> yeah. All, everyone would, who writes in a book is a poet. I'm going to have you on one of the shows, Nick. Going to be okay. on my I was just okay. going to say why. <laughs> right? He doesn't know how to write poetry. No, but I read it. But he sees movies. Really? And I do see movies. I see artful mm -hmm. movies like Requiem for a Dream. You'll watch anything. I will. I will. Um, follow me on Twitter at the Big Nick J. It is getting spicy. <laughs> getting in fights over people on this parlor thing. Gianmarco, have you heard of Parlor? Oh, I ha I have. I've, I've never not seen like a picture of the site or how it's different than. Is it Twitterish? I know it's yes. concerned, you know, but it's like it's functions like there's a retweet. Yes. Okay. And it is. It's basically a vacuum for all the right wing extremists. It and is. And what happened to Gab? Was the one before that, right? I think Gab is still around. 
Yeah, I'm just, I, I guess I'm confused. I thought Gab was going to be that thing. Because I have a belief that, well, tr- well, Twitter already, it's not a, like a unique opinion. Twitter is getting rid of Trump's special status after his presidential. And I'm like, it's only a matter of time after that, that they kick him off. <laughs> He'll eventually say something. And that's, I imagine, oh, Parler's launching now because they want to be the home for when Trump moves. Makes sense. Maybe. But yeah. you can get into arguments about it? Just, I just don't under, well, I, I play both sides because I'm sort of in the middle. Like I see good sides on both and shitty sides on both. But no, I was getting into an argument because um, I just told this guy, I was like, what fun is it to be on a platform where everybody agrees with you? Like sometimes the best things in Twitter are the fights. These guys will attest. I've gotten in some pretty heavy, heavy <laughs> fights. <laughs> well, maybe I, 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 I had the thought that like, well, people can't agree forever. And I mean, that's always been like one of the things with, with uh, like Democrats or on the left versus the right. It certainly feels like the left doesn't unify, Mm -mm. which I don't think is it's, I mean, it's a bad thing for winning sometimes, but I also think like that's good. Whereas it feels like Republicans in general, there doesn't feel like there's that much dissent or there is a lot more like everyone lining up. And part of my thought is maybe if it's on a platform, eventually, factions will come out there is like a group of gun rights people that think the nra is full of shit and it's kind of like there i think this other group is even more extreme but it's like well good the and the the nra is no longer the centralized power that is like so strong no one should have this level of strength so maybe parlor will result in people going like well i want to disagree with this right now and then fighting and then you know maybe it's maybe it's good you want to get people to fight make them live together you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> somebody have a kid in the background yeah i'm sorry There's, i don't want to oh, i'll just fucking go back outside <laughs> Tuesday nights, <laughs> 6 p.m. We can't do it any later. All right. Um, Inside the Comic Studio is brought to you by the Seattle Gummy Company. They have a wide array of gummies from energy to CBD to immune mocha shots, high energy gummies. They work five times faster than coffee, but half the price. Five grams of sugar per gummy. Only have one package at a time. I please do not have three. Use promo code GAG15 to save 15% off your entire order, and that promo code works on all of the gummies that I just mentioned. And just came out with a gingerbread. Gross. And a pumpkin spice. (laughs) All right. So what we do for Inside the Comic Studios, we ask all comedians the same five questions. Cool. So the first question is, first joke that landed well. Um, ooh, I was, I, I think the first one, the first bit I had was, um, that did well. An ex-girlfriend texted me. She said, Hey, what kind of KY did we use? And, uh, and I was like, the, the, this was, this was the chunk. It was like, Oh, that's a text with, I think I can remember it. Oh, that's a text with a lot of subtext. The subtext being, Hey, Joe Marco, I don't miss anything about your heart, mind, body, or soul, but what's that KY we used to use all the time? Um, other than that, you can go fuck yourself, but text me that when you get a chance. <laughs> or it was like something, yeah, something about like, I'm having, oh, it's like, hey, just so you know, I'm having so much sex that my natural bodily lubricants are not nearly sufficient to facilitate the amount of sex that I'm having. You laughing at it is dangerous because I'm like, maybe I should bring this one back. <laughs> but that was the first, like, where I, right, it was before I started stand-up comedy, but, like, when she texted me that, I was like, this isn't, like, it was just that feeling of, like, there's so much to unpack here. Well, hey, just know that you weren't doing it for her, that's why she needed it, and now this guy's not doing it for her either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll I'll let myself know that back in 2010. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, second question. Favorite thing about your local comedy scene? Um, does it have to be? Can it just? It'll be very narcissistic. Is that I I worked at this club called LOL, which uh, 
it, it's it's a rough and tumble club and i think there there are some comics who who it's like a crowd that's barked in from times square and it can be really fucking tough and um i won't go into too many judgments that other comedians might have about it but i got in there when i was like a year in and I became the check spot guy and I was able to perform uh, four spots a night, uh, four spots a night every weekday. And then during the holiday season weekends, I do five in the holiday season. There was a time I was doing eight spots a day. And then after that I left checks and I was started hosting there and it got to a place where I would be there 30, 30 spots hosting or doing a regular 15 minute set every week. And, um, I do think it's it's like the kind of room where you have to fight the urge of giving into hacky premises or like, uh, you know, you, you could in that room see two guys sitting next to each other be like, oh, you, you fucking, uh, you gay? And it would crush. And like, if you, but if you have a ruler inside yourself and you, you challenge yourself not to fall in easy pratfalls, there's just nowhere in this contemporary comedy world where you're not famous that I could get that kind of time. And, uh, it, it really, I think it helped me excel in a way that I could not have done in almost any other Avenue. And, um, I was very, I was just grateful for it. It's very tough and it was very tough. And in the kind of rooms where like bad, bad situations or bad mic setups or crazy hecklers, they don't, I'm not scared of it in a way that I would be if I didn't deal with this kind of uh, fly by the seat of your pants type place. So I'm very grateful to have been a part of that club. All right. Now the exact opposite. One thing you dislike and would like to see changed in your local scene. Um, I mean, I imagine this is like a lot of people's complaints. It's, it's just like, there's, you know, one or two bookers who maybe they saw me when I was too early and it feels like almost it's inescapable for them to see me as a working comic or like everything. It's just like there's at every club, there's some people where you're like, they're amazing. And some you're like, I don't understand why they're getting this many spots or that it just feels like, oh, I can't get in at this club. I don't know what else I could do to impress this person. And you feel you have to take, you have to count your blessings and be like, well, I am at these clubs and I do have these chances, but it feels very frustrating when there's a club you love and it feels like the booker doesn't, doesn't dig your style for whatever reason. And you go like, well, fuck, I, I live here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you're not in at a club, it also feels like you don't get the, the access to a social scene. And you're like, I'm not going to be able to hang out with these people every night, or I'm not going to be at the club where the, the comedians ahead of me who are touring and need a feature are going to see me. Mm. Um, and I imagine it's like that everywhere. And, and part of me wonders if more clubs close, uh, will, will decentralized comedy be a little more exciting? Will it be frustrating? Um, I think the problem is uh, the biggest problem about New York though, is there's just too many comedians. There's too many standup comedians and there's not the, 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 there's just too many. It's just too fucking many. There's nothing you can do at a certain point with there's so many comedians. And if, if any comedian wanted to, there was, there's this uh, not in, not in the documentary, but I'm dying up here. The book about standup comedy oh, yeah. where they struck to get money. They talk about this ability where they would rent out a hotel room and all the LA comedians would be in this conference room and they would talk it out. And I'm like, to do that in New York, you'd have to rent Yankee stadium. Like there's, you can no longer, you could never unionize standup comedians because there's way too many. There'd be scabs in a fucking heartbeat. You could, you could an entire roster of a club. I believe you could get rid of them and you could fill up the club without any of those people and still put on good shows. And um, I don't know what the solution is because obviously every standup comedian believes they should be passed at every club. And every standup com comedian believes that a booker that didn't like them is wrong. Uh, but in my case, I'm correct. <laughs> Do you think Zoom's going to, or Zoom, the pandemic's going to keep, weed some people out? Uh, just so everyone knows, that was, oh, it's on video. That was sar sort of sarcastic. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I told people for a while, I was like, that's the hope. 
that stand-up comedy weeds people out. Um, it brought more people in, in my opinion. It's like, oh, well, I've never done a mic, or I've never done this, or I've never done that, but I'm going to do Zoom. And it's like, okay. Sure, sure. Okay. I mean, you hope that, I, I think what it, here's what I think it has to be. You know what, I'm sorry to keep bringing up this documentary, but I had this other thought last night, because there's all these comedians in the documentary, like Jim Carrey, for example, where they talk kind of about them not really having jokes. It's more characters. And I think like, oh, Jim Carrey was less a stand-up comedian and he would be more, he'd be on a, a sketch team or doing front face camera videos that would go like crazy viral. Like, and there's those front facing camera people who do brilliantly, a brilliant, fucking amazing. And they found their avenue. But the problem is we live in an industry where then they go to those camera people and they say, all right, now let's have you headline and go on a tour. And they fucking suck at stand-up. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Because it's a totally different medium. I would suck doing characters. And I think the problem is stand-up comedy is kind of like this. Everyone has to participate in it or that's it's extra money, it's extra press. And it, it's kind of like, the character people and some actors and all these, they all have to do stand-up comedy. And it includes, and then I'm sure you're all great, great comics, but a podcast is another thing where like, there is like podcasting and part of it's like, you're an amazing podcaster. Why don't you just do live podcast recordings? Do you need to be doing stand-up because you're not good? Yeah. And <laughs> but there's this mix where like, I think there was a time where if you sucked at stand-up, you were bullied. Uh, and I think like, especially uh, to, to use the, the, the euphemism, urban rooms, like when you bomb in urban rooms, you fucking feel like shit. <laughs> there is no, hey, good work. I, 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 I featured for this comedian um, named JP and he was talking to me about, uh, I think he was talking about Catch a Rising Star and I believe, and it was like this big moment um, where he was performing and he, he bombed for whatever reason, something happened, he bombed and he walked off and Tracy Morgan was back there and he was like, and it's his friend. <laughs> and, his, and Tracy Morgan was like, uh, don't get that, don't get that stink on me, man. <laughs> and he like, you know, he walked home and he cried. And like, I don't know if that's, <laughs> I don't know if that's good. I don't know if that's good, but I, I do know so. this. If he kept bombing, he would not be doing stand up anymore. So, you know, fuck if I know what the solution is. But then also the other thing is if, if you really love stand-up and you think you're good at it and uh, you have to figure out whether it's the podcast or it's the TikToks, you're going to have to go like, well, fuck. You're going to have to find one of these avenues and you're going to have to get fucking good at it. And it sucks, but do that. And hopefully, hopefully the cream will rise to the top and you're the cream. <laughs> If that's what you're going for. <laughs> but it's like you said, what about the people like they did TikTok and Vine and then they get thrown on to do on to be a cup comedian at a stand-up show and then they basically bomb, you know. So they it's like they don't see that they're they're good at TikTok and making those vibes. Yeah. Right there. yeah. Well look, you're you're never gonna be able to if people make money, you're never gonna be able to fix it. Uh, they're not going to stop or if people see them, like, what are you going to do with Southern mama or whatever that guy is? Like, what are you going to tell him? Like tell his fans, like, this isn't good though. Uh, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's an overall, I mean, the problem is we're also fractured and certainly stand up comedians. We have trouble like fighting for each other because we're just trying to stay alive out here. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is you need to create a, a delivery system. And this includes Netflix and HBO and the way people consume stand up where good stand-up comedy is featured and like that these networks promote good stand-up under the belief that good, that if it's good, people will return more often. And you hopefully cleanse the whole system where people more readily recognize what's good versus what's bad, but it's very hard. There's clubs in New York that clearly sales were rough they started relying on a bringer system and the club went to shit and they decided, you know what, we'll have half a star on Yelp and we'll just do bringers a bunch of the time. And that's how we'll make our money. But then what happens? Someone goes to New York, 
they get barked into a comedy club and they go, ooh, my, my first stand-up club experience. Oh. And they see a bringer show. It's three and a half hours long. And they get charged 60 bucks for drinks. It sucks. And that person says to themselves, they go, oh, I don't like stand-up comedy. And now we have now lost a customer for the rest of their lifetime. Yeah. But what are you going to tell this, this shitty comedy club? Hey, you, you got to stop doing this for the good of the community. <laughs> I don't know. So I, I don't know. It, it feels very hopeless. And I think the only way to do it is, is good stand-up comedians have to lead the way. And part of that is playing the game of the podcasts and the TikToks and the whatnot. And then encouraging and, and, and up, uh, raising up great comedians. You know, it's, it's – but I, I, you see a lot of comedians that become super famous – and I don't blame them. They're kind of like, I don't want to touch comedy clubs anymore. I'm so lucky to have escaped this nightmare system. I'm done. But those are the ones who can enact the change. Seinfeld is the guy who can say to a club, hey, I'm not dropping into your fucking place until you stop this shit. He's the only one. It's that level. And they got to care. And or they got to buy the club and you see the clubs that do it like Comedy Cellar where like they've people go to the cellar partly to see famous people, of course. But like it's they always they don't do bringer shows. And I don't know if there was ever a time in their history where they could have used the money from a bringer show, but they, they, they didn't. And now they, they have a good Yelp rating and people go there for the comedy store. But it's hard because you also have a lot of mediocre comedians who who start running things not everyone who runs things is a mediocre comic but like it's obviously a solution to stay in the game and spot trading and all this stuff and it feels very hard it just feels like every system becomes corrupt i don't think people who book a club should be a stand-up comic i mean it's power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely and uh it's tough (laughs) I don't have a lot of hope for it. And that's why I'm learning TikTok. You know, that's why I'm like, well, I can either bitch and moan for the rest of my fucking life, which I could, and I probably will, but I'm like, let's do TikTok or else you're just going to be a whiner. Yeah. If you don't adapt, I mean, what the fuck? You got to adapt with the times. Yeah. But TikTok is for learning. Haven't you guys seen that commercial? No. Oh yeah. It's for learning. Bill Nye's on there. A bunch of people. Everyone's on TikTok. I've learned that I hate TikTok. Does that count? <laughs> oh, I TikTok. If I watch it, like it makes me cry. It makes me laugh. It's uh, it's almost too much. It's uh, it's why I swear. If you spend a little time, don't do it. But <laughs> spend a little I won't. Time, it. <laughs> I I do know that TikTok. They have their their um videos are I think what a minute or two minutes a minute, long. A minute. Whereas um gag or what well, well, real Instagram real. It's only like 30, 40 seconds. 30, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know there's a difference there. So. Uh, so, yeah, I don't you know. got a podcast, you're fine. You know, you don't got to do everything. <laughs> I always think like, do I need a podcast? Then I'm like, well, I'll do TikTok. You know, we all, we all find our avenues. All right. Um, speaking of good comedians, who is your favorite local comedian? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, one that, that, that I always think about and I feel like quote, his name is Renan Hirschberg. Um, he, uh, he was just on um, uh, uh, the late, late show with James, James Corden. Um, and he has two albums out and he's just a fucking, he has these bits that are just so smart. And, and, and I, th- you know, just the kind of bits where like things happen in life and you're like, I've said to so many people, oh, it's like this bit this comedian has, or blah, 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 blah. Um, one of my favorites that I, I, would, I, would, I would butcher all the other ones, but he has a great Game of Thrones one. Back when everyone was saying, like, you know, the people complain about there's all this rape in Game of Thrones. And, and he's like, guys, you have to understand, George R.R. R. Martin is just being truthful to the world he completely made up in his head. <laughs> and it's... And it's just, it's just one of these thoughts you're like, oh, fuck. What a funny, truthful, watch, watch his James Corden. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the best late night sets I've certainly ever seen. His name is Renan Hirschberg? 
Yeah, Renan, R-A-N-A-A-N. And then okay. I think with an I. Very good. I'll have to check that out. All right, last question. And you kind of went over some of it, but just in case you got any more. Advice to new comedians. Uh, turn, turn back before it's too late. That's, of course, the number one. But I, I think uh, you got you to gotta diversify what, you're, what places you're playing. Like, for example, one of my, one of my biggest like, turns into understanding what joke writing was, was roast battles. And I think it's because you can't rely on charisma for the most part. Some people get away with it amazingly, but it's like, really, you have an objective. I'm going to take an aspect of this person, make a joke where there is a real like reveal that gets a pop. And I learned a lot from that format. And I know a lot of people don't like roast jokes or, or they, it's something about the whole thing it, it rubs them the wrong way, but I'm like, just do it because it's such a, it's such a high, it's like, it feels intense. The stakes are high and you just really understand what it is to structure a joke. So I think that would be my biggest thing. Now there's lots of comedians that like just do roast battles and are amazing and then suck at stand up. So again, diversify, but roast battles for me were the thing that taught me what joke writing was. Hmm. That's the first time we've heard that. So that's good advice. Look at that. Do you guys have any questions before we let this very busy man go? No, I appreciate it. I uh, loved your special. I think you're awesome. And follow me on the IG and I'll fucking hook you up with the guys in Vegas. Will do. Sounds good. And then she's going to go flicker bean to your shirtless no probably not <laughs> <laughs> maybe do his comedy special we'll, well see we'll see how that wait, goes wait gian marco do you own any ed hardy stuff no he doesn't no is that uh, i went through a skater boy phase is that close to ed hardy um did you have douchebags yeah did you have like very colorful tigers on your shirt with Ryan. no he's not the one he's not the guy to do that maybe in high school i went through like a brief goth phase a brief nope a brief skater boy phase even though i couldn't skate uh, <laughs> oh yeah did you, Ryan, did you paint your nails black i did <laughs> and i liked it i'll tell you something i liked it i i liked something about black nails i can I, I picture do that man that yeah Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, we, my computer's going to die. I got to go. Yeah, we will let you go. Thank you for coming on. This was a great episode, man. I appreciate it a ton. Go watch his special, Shelf Life, on Amazon Prime. It is hilarious. You will not be disappointed. And if you are, follow him on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Later. Thank you. Take care. Ciao.